And in chapter four, it's mostly looking at things to do with graphs and things with transformations. We spend the beginning part of this chapter learning how to draw more interesting kinds of graphs, because so far, we only know how to draw straight line graphs and quadratics, really. That's the most, the two kinds of graphs we know how to do so far. So what we're going to be spending today's lesson thinking about is cubic graphs and quartic graphs. And we'll be doing a little bit more on that. Yep. And then what we're going to do after that is we will be looking at reciprocal graphs and then a little bit more about how you might represent some of these graphs, um, well, graphically. And then last of all, this is quite a big part, we'll be looking at how you transform graphs, which has some things linked to GCSE that you may have seen, but I'm going to be teaching it all fresh because I want to make sure we all start at exactly the same point and we can all reach the top, top grades that we can, okay? So I'm going to start off by talking about polynomial graphs. And I've said here that we have previously seen that a polynomial expression is of the form a plus bx plus cx squared plus dx cubed, um, that should say plus ex to the power of 4, there's a printing error there, etc., where a, b, c, d, e, etc. are constants, and some of those constants could be zero. It, for it to be a polynomial, it could just ha have some of these bits. It doesn't need to have all of those bits in there for it to be a polynomial. And the order of the polynomial, this phrase that we say the order of a polynomial, is its highest power that it has. So um, if you have a polynomial which is of order 0, that means that the highest power it's got is actually x to the power of 0. Now, x to the power of 0, we know, is just 1. So it's actually just saying the constant part of it. And the name of this is just, it is a constant. Okay, that's what we would say a polynomial of order zero is just a constant. What is it called, though, if it looks something like this, if it's of order one, where the highest power is x to the power of one? What do we call this? What do we call these kinds of equations, Andrew? Linear, linear good. These are linear. So make sure you're writing these down, please. So if it has a power of one in it as the highest power, it's linear. And these ones we've already covered in chapter five when we did straight line graphs. The next ones, I mean, I'm not even going to ask you what this one is. We know when it has the highest power is a power of two. It is called a quadratic. And you've already looked at quadratics in chapter two in your other maths lessons. Then we get to the next ones that we're going to be doing in this chapter, which is where the highest power is three and then the highest power is four. When it's the highest power of three, we call that a a cubic. OK, so this is a cubic and a cubic might be something like x cubed minus 3x squared plus 7. Notice how it doesn't have to have an x necessarily. It could just have x squared, x cubed and a constant. It doesn't have to have all features. Just the highest power has to be uh, the one that makes it a cubic. And you may have seen it on the previous page, but if it has a power of 4, what does power of 4? How do we what do, what's that one called? A quartic, yeah, it's called a quartic, like this. And a quartic could be something like, I don't know, minus x to the power of 4 minus 3x squared minus 10. That's still a quartic because the highest power that it's got there is a power of 4. And the last one, I'll just say what this one could be. I don't know, it could just be like 3x to the power of 5 minus 12x. That's a one with a power of five. Anyone think they know what the power of five is? Might have heard it before. Andrew? Quintic? Yes, it's a quintic. OK, it's a quintic if it goes up to a power of five. And you could find out what the other ones are. I don't know the other ones off the top of my head. And I've said that we're going to, in this chapter, we're going to be covering cubics and quartics. And quintics, whilst they're not technically within the A-level syllabus, I do want to think about how you might sketch a quintic, particularly if some of you are going to want to be applying to some top universities. This is an area of maths they like to explore, like what happens if you go a bit beyond the curriculum? What happens if you're going to try and explore something a bit extra? Do you have a question? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I thought you had your hand up. OK, so hopefully you've got those written down. We already know how to do constants, linears, and quadratics. We're going to learn about cubics and quartics. We're not going to actually do stuff with quintics, but we're going to think about how we could extend it to quintics if we wanted to. So the next thing I wanted to think about with these polynomial graphs is actually what they look like, OK? What sketches of polynomial graphs should look like here. And if you have a graph of order 2, in other words, a quadratic, you know that quadratics 
either look like this shape or this shape that we've got here. Okay, you will have come across that. What makes the difference between whether it's going to be this shape on the right or this shape on the left? How do you know which shape it's going to be? A negative, what's sorry? Negative or positive, but where though? For the x squared coefficient. If the x squared coefficient is negative, it would look like this. If the x squared coefficient is positive, it will look like this. And so cubics don't always look exactly like this, but they can look like this kind of shape, or they could look like this kind of shape that we've got down here. And then quartics can look like this kind of shape that we have like this. Does anybody spot how you can connect together the order with the shape, the rough shape of the graph, how you might try and explain what that connection is, Zainab? So it could be the number of points of intersection with the x-axis. Like here, it could be crossing in two places. But I might challenge you on that, because if I had a cubic where it was like this, it looks like it's only going to cross the x-axis in one place. So I'm not sure it's necessarily going to be with where it's crossing the x-axis, because it may not cross it as many times as you expect it to. Andrew? How many times it changes direction? Yeah, that's one of the ways we could think about this. For this graph here, it's going like this, and it changes direction once. This one is changing direction once, twice. And this one is changing once, twice, three times. So it changes direction one time less than the order. The other way that I think about that to not have to deal with it being one time less is I just kind of count like how many phases of the line there is. So I can see here it's like one, two, one, two, one, two, three, one. That middle bit is kind of like a different phase. It's a bit harder to see. One, two, three, and one, two, three, four. So I kind of see like how many phases of the line it has. I'm going to probably write down um, Andrew's one. So Andrew's one said it changes direction. one time less than the order or I don't really know how to f how to phrase that one I was just saying it's like up down up I guess it goes kind of like the number of lines or like the number of sections of the graph it's, it's really hard to explain isn't it so Not, not talking about an enlargement with it, no. Andrew? Yeah, I guess so. Let's just say it's the number. It's, this, is not, this is not a perfect de a definition here. Please don't ever say this to anyone else. So I don't know, how, don't know how to explain it. As long as we understand it. The number of directions it goes in. I mean, it's going in loads and loads of different directions because it's bending. But roughly, up, down, up for cubic. Okay? And so if I was going to predict what a quintic might look like, it would be like up down, up, down, up, okay? One, two, three, four, five, or changing direction once, twice, three, four times. So quintics look something like that, quartics look something like that. They don't always look like this, and we're going to look at some variations of how these graphs might look as well. And we already said this from chapter two. In chapter two, how did we tell what way up a quadratic is and why does this work? Well, Zainab told me that we look at the x squared coefficient if it is greater than 0 if it's positive it looks like this and if it's less than 0 it looks like this but the question also says why does that work so have a think to yourself, why is it that the coefficient of the x squared bit, why, why does that work? And I'm going to make one up like this. If I say y equals x squared plus 7, why, why when it's got a positive coefficient here, does it make that shape? Yeah, tell me, not when y, becomes, y wouldn't become a negative, because y is not going to be a negative in this particular expression we've got here. What do you think, Andrew? Is it really weird because sort of the x squared sort of remains in linear and directional graph? 
I'm not sure about that definition. So I think if you were to imagine what happens to this graph, what happens when you put in big values of x? So when you put in values of x that become very big, and I'm going to use this infinity symbol here, positive, if you put in a big value of x, what kind of value would you get for y? A big value, a small value, a negative value, positive or negative? Positive. You would get, so if, you, if x becomes a big number, y becomes a big number. So when I think about the graph, when x becomes really big over here, y is going to be really big over here. And when x becomes a really negative number, what would happen to y? What happens if you put a really big but negative number in here and you square it? It becomes positive. So y would go to a positive infinity, which is if I can now just actually make a bit more space here, you can see that when you have the graph, for big values of x, it's going to be somewhere up here. And for very negative values of x, it's going to be somewhere up here. And in between, we know it's that kind of shape. So that's why it behaves in that way. And if it was the other way around, if it had a minus in front of it, then the y's would go to a negative infinity on both sides. So that's why it behaves in that particular way and why we get that kind of graph shape. And we're going to try and investigate what other shapes the graphs produce. Yeah, Jamil? Do you not think that for minus in front of it, there has to be in brackets and then minus outside the brackets? No, so let me, let me just do you another example to hopefully clear up what your question is. So if we did one and it, instead it was, I don't know, just y equals minus x squared, if I put in a really big value of x, what would y, what kind of value would you get for y? No, because when you put in a positive value for x and you square it, you'd get a positive value. And then you're making it negative. So you would get a negative value for y. What about if you put in a really negative value for x, like minus 1,000? You'd square it, and it would become positive, because a negative times a negative is positive. But then you have a negative that you're doing to it afterwards. So it would also give you a really negative value. So that means when you were thinking about the graph, we know that when x is a really big value somewhere over here, y is a really small value. And when x is a really negative value, y is also a really negative value, which is why it gives you that kind of shape like this. Because if x was in between at 0, uh, when x is 0, we know it's going to give you that kind of shape. That was meant to hit there, and it didn't. So that's what we're going to try and investigate on the next page. Like, where do these kinds of graph shapes come from for cubics and quartics? And maybe we can think about quintics if we want to as well. OK? So. I'm going to just go through this first one that we've got here for quadratics, and then we're going to have a think about what quintics might look like. So I have got here a quadratic equation. I've kept it as general as possible here. And I'm saying if a is greater than 0, in other words, if the coefficient of x squared is greater than 0, this is just like what we were talking about here. As x becomes a really big number, y would also be a positive big number. And if x was a negative number, big number, then y would still be a positive. So we've got that positive, positive shape like this. And we just did this negative one that we had here. As x goes towards infinity, y would go towards negative infinity. As x goes towards negative infinity, y would also go towards negative infinity, which is why we have the tails of the graph. This is concentrating on the tails, by the way. The tails of the graph here are both in the positive section. The tails of the graph here are both in the negative section. So that's why I've got these tail bits. That's what I really should have highlighted. They're in the positive infinities, and these ones are in the negative sections that we've got like this. So I might just do one of these, and then you're going to do the rest for me in just a second. So we're going to have a look at this cubic one that we've got here, and we're going to think what happens when x becomes a big number. We're going to think what happens to the tail of that cubic graph. So if you're putting in a really big positive number for x, this would be positive. This would be positive. And these ones, they don't really matter so much. Because when you make a number, when a big number gets cubed, it becomes huge. Okay, It becomes so huge when you cube a big number that the squaring and the linear and the constant don't really make much of a difference to it. So when x becomes a really positive number, y becomes a really positive number. 
which means the tail of the graph is going to be up in the positive section. What about, though, if I put in a really negative number into this equation that I've got here? Andrew? Why would be really negative? Because if you take a negative number and you cube it, what kind of answer do you get? A negative. So this bit at the beginning would be negative, which means these things, you can basically ignore them because they're going to be a lot smaller. So y would go to negative infinity, which means the tail would be somewhere down here in the negative section. And then in between, we know it's going to be that shape for a cubic. One, two, three. So I'd like you to think about the tails of the other graph. There's the positive tail and the negative tail for these. I want you to think about what it would be if a was less than 0. And then I want you to try and reason what it would look like for, quadratic, sorry, for quartics and for quintics as well. Okay.